Welcome everyone to the STEM student talks number five. This is the fifth symposium. Um, we have a full roster of amazing projects to share with you. And today we have four students presenting on a variety of topics in this session. So in the room today with us is Judge Alex Parola, a graduate from Princeton University and a hardware design engineer who will be scoring each student's presentation along with myself. I am the moderator. My name is Allie Munson. I'm also uh, from Princeton University. I just graduated this past year. Um, so for everyone, if Throughout the presentations, you could please type your questions in the chat if you have any for each speaker. At the end, we'll allot about three to five minutes of questions after each presentation. And the way you can find the Q&A is on the right side of your screen, there should be a little arrow. If you don't see just the session part and event tab, if you click on the session tab, there is a spot in which you can click Q&A and that is where you can type your questions. Um, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. First we have, and please let me know if I am pronouncing your name incorrectly. I think first we have, oh, maybe they're not coming with us today. Um, we have Hiba Bidar, a sophomore from Suos, Massa, Morocco. Oops, sorry. let's see if I did this right. Um, hello, I believe that I'm audible and that you are able to see my screen. Not yet. Um, well, I'm back now. Oh, yes, now I can. Great. So, hello again. My name is Hiba Vidar. I'm 15 years old. And today, I could not be more delighted to be presenting to you my work about modeling the real time effect of solar radiation on the equatorial ionosphere. So, today, we are going to deeply dive into the world of cosmology, energy particle physics, geoscience, and surely atmospheric sciences. And what we're going to do is that we're going to learn more about space and how does it impact us here on Earth. So, we will definitely stick to the equatorial region of Earth, and we will be studying in a more of general way how space weather impacts North Africa. So, without further ado, let's kick off our journey through the cosmos by, first of all, setting up our objectives. So, by doing this work, we aim to, first of all, um, provide a solid proof of knowledge that space weather exists and that it does actually impact us here on Earth. And by doing so, we would love to inform the public, the decision makers, the policy makers of the paramount importance of such topic and, the, and its massive impact on our daily lives and hopefully act accordingly, especially given that space weather seems to be widely ignored in climate policies. And foremost, we would love to study the space and terrestrial interactions and, of course, achieve a broadened understanding of the dynamics of the upper atmosphere and all of those irregularities that occur above our skies. So to give you some background and perspective about what does actually happen above our skies and what space weather is, I would invite you to visualize the following video. So as you can see here, this is the sun. So this is the core of our solar system. And those spots right here are sunspots and correlate with solar activity. So this light over here could be a solar storm, a solar flare, and it, it, it's, it is ejected to interstellar space in form of solar wind. So I'm going to pause here um, to simply clarify what solar wind is. So solar wind is basically this set of um, particles 
will be primarily photons and electrons in state known as plasma. So there are plasma particles and those particles constitute this continuous flow from uh, outward from the sun that there is very likely to strike Earth based on Earth's orbital characteristics. Um, so fortunately, our magnetic field shields us from solar wind, and although a small portion manages its way, of course, to the upper atmosphere, what our magnetic field does is that it redirects this solar radiation to the northern and southern poles of Earth, creating a very beautiful aurora and an opportunity for all observers all around Earth to simply witness the beauty of our, of our universe. So as you can see here on this video on the left, this is the heliosphere of Earth. And you might see that once it contracts, more cosmic rays penetrate Earth, while uh, when it actually expands, it's more of a shield to us from cosmic rays. And this video on the right is, is the ionosphere. So to clarify again, the ionosphere is this region, um, this atmospheric layer, um, th that is basically uh, con constituted of plasma particles and ionized particles. And the ionosphere is shaped from above by space weather and from below by anthropogenic activities. And uh, the ionosphere has so much energy, it's like a very dynamic region, that in fact Nikola Tesla has attempted to extract electricity from at least what we call today the ionosphere. So that was a, a very generalized view of what space weather is. Um, so you might be wondering why specifically Africa? Well, uh, first of all, Africa, the whole continent spans over the most region of the equatorial region of Earth. So it simply makes sense because we are focusing on the equatorial ionosphere. And to understand more why I've, uh, I've specifically chosen North Africa, I would invite you to take a look at this picture. So this is the weather map of the whole African continent. And as you, may, uh, as you can notice, North Africa is characterized with this very uniform type of climate. It's actually a warm desert climate. And if you can see my cursor, this region all, all, all from here is a desert. So why is that important? It's actually very important because it simply would be very interesting to see how such a very specific type of climate and such how, and, so, and how such a very specific type of land will react to some far away space weather events or simply nearby in our solar system. And I'm currently presenting, I'm presenting to you the slides from a city right here, Agadir, which was one of the personal reasons why I have chosen North Africa. So now that we know all of this stuff about space weather and the Earth's atmosphere, you might be wondering what's the next step. Well, what we have done is that we are currently building a climate model that will track the trajectory of solar wind and follow this impact on, first of all, the magnetic field, then the Earth's upper atmosphere, of course, with an emphasis on the equatorial ionosphere. And based on that, we can deduce the impacts of solar rays on our land-based ecosystem. So to do this, we're going to deal with a lot of data, well, primarily data related to space, um, uh, like research space, of course, data related to the atmosphere, uh, mainly the suborbital region of Earth, and of course, we still data things like albedo rates or greenhouse gases emissions. And here's um, a view of the methodologies we will adapt. So we will need data regarding solar radiations. Um, like the number of sunspots during a very specific period of time, or simply the uh, the solar energy flux. And we're going to see how does this data we have, the satellite data we have, we're going to see how does it correlate with variations in the magnetic field. And based on that, plus uh, any observed or measured ionospheric disturbances, we can deduce how solar radiation contribute to any chemical variations in our atmosphere. And what I mean here by atmosphere is mainly the stratosphere and the troposphere. 
But of course, since we are in the 21st century, um, we will definitely need to introduce to our model another parameter, which is related to anthropogenic activities. And you might have guessed it, it's about greenhouse gases emissions because they also play a major role in this whole process. And following this liner approach, we hope to understand how each of the greenhouse gases emissions and solar radiation contributes one another to chemical radiations in the atmosphere. And by doing so, hopefully, we would love to achieve a more broadened understanding of climate change. So we are currently building the model. There are no results available yet. However, we intend from this model to actually confirm our current state of, loan, of knowledge and simply tell us that this is how much greenhouse gases emissions contribute to climate change and this is how much space we are contribute to climate change. And maybe there will be some other factor that will emerge and we will be so prompted to simply learn more, understand more and hopefully act accordingly. So before jumping out to the, to the questions section, I would love to take a moment to thank my mentor, Joe, who guided me through this whole process. So I would love to thank her for her time and consideration and assistance. So thank you, Ms. Joe. And without further ado, if you have any questions, I would be so happy to answer them. Feel free to ask. So that was all. Thank you. It was a great presentation. <laughs> um, if anybody has questions, please type them in the chat or the Q&A section. If you would like to speak up and ask them here on the screen, I can add you. Um, just let me know then through the chat function. And to do that, um, again, click on the right side where it says session and underneath that you should see where you're able to uh, to write. Iba, is that how you say your name? Tell me if I'm yeah. pronouncing it right. I'm just yeah. kind of curious more generally, how did you get interested in this topic? Yeah, well, I've uh, chosen this topic because since ever I was a child, I was very interested in space stuff, anything related to space. And I would have loved to actually combine my passion for space with the current global issue, which is climate change. And this is how I learned more about space weather and how I, I, I would have loved to actually address this problem and see how space and climate could intersect. And yeah, that was all. Very nice. And we um, do so have I, one I, question, yeah. um, which is, how did you do or are you doing the data collection? Yeah, well, it's actually kind of an overwhelming process because um, there are actually, I guess, 3,300 satellites orbiting Earth. So there are a lot of data to deal with, especially that um, this whole process uh, there is definitely a lot of data, like data related to space, data related to greenhouse gases emissions or um, chemical variations in the atmosphere. And as we are actually introducing this interprogenic activity section to the model, there is there is simply more data added. And that was actually one of the reasons why I've chosen North Africa, because it has a very uniform type of climate that it will kind of minimize this whole data collection process. So, um, yeah, we're purely collecting data from um, from diverse from diverse sites. Like uh, there is the NOAA uh, website that provides open data, and I just want to point out that all of data we're using is open citizen data because this whole project is simply about using citizen science to actually address this address climate change and how does it inter intersect with space. So I hope that answers the question. 
Thank you. And I'm sure you can see in the chat, but you have some congratulations and awesome <laughs> responses to your presentation. Um, yes, so Manal Dajar just asked why exactly North Africa? I think you did just explain that a little bit, but if you wanna just reiterate or elaborate again, yeah, definitely. So why specifically North Africa? Well, I would start with uh, why Africa? Well, our project is about modeling, of course, uh, the, the effects of solar radiation on the equatorial ionosphere. And when talking about the equatorial ionosphere, we, we're going to uh, definitely stick to the equatorial region of Earth. And the African continent is uh, the largest continent in the equatorial region of Earth. So it spans over this most the most of this region. And as I said earlier, North, we have chosen North Africa specifically because it has this uniform type of climate, which is um, a, a warm desert climate and this gonna minimize the data we will introduce to the model and make it as simple as possible to be simply practical and usable by the public the decision makers the policy makers and everybody interested in knowing more about this subject very good okay with that i'm just going to check one more time last chance for questions and then we will move on to our next presenter. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, Great job fine. again. I'm okay. going to, let's see if I can manage. Move. Okay. And so next up, we are going to have Basant. Oh, goodness. Let me see if I can pronounce your name correct, last name correctly. Gojineni, a junior from Bangalore, Karnataka, India. Let me add you to the screen. Yeah, so um, should I share my screen now? Yes, you can go yes, ahead you can. and, I'm oh, sorry, I think I echoed. <laughs> go ahead and share your screen and you may begin. Yeah, so can, can you see the presentation? Okay, so. Um, I think not yet. I'm not sure if this okay. is just a little bit um, laggy. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so, uh, should I begin? Okay, thank yes, thank you. So, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Vasant, and good morning and good evening. So, my Pathogens project is on optimizing satellite paths for communication. So, so the, when we come to the abstract of the project, so this is basically an outline of the project. So, um, in today's world, we have increasing communication everywhere. And for that, there's a lot more satellites in space. So we need quick algorithms that can decide the optimal time or location to communicate with these satellites. And that's called the optimal communication rendezvous. And that's basically finding the optimal time or location around uh, uh, planets to communicate with different satellites. And these satellites are constrained by thrust and um, the planets they're bound to. So in this Venn diagram here, you can see that um, our constraints are a solar system, and inside the solar system, we have a planet and a star, or multiple planets and multiple stars, and then we have a satellites in it, and they have to communicate occasionally, and they're constrained by thrust. So this is the abstract of the project, and the way we'll be, we'll be exploring this is by first diving into the orbital mechanics and equations of motion in space, finding um, or how to model it. And then we'll be putting that those equations into practice in the vPython simulation, which is basically a simulation software 
we can use to simulate orbital mechanics in Python. And then we'll move on to the mathematical optimization problem. So in the mathematical optimization problem, we can introduce certain constraints like the fuel constraints and the areas of interest and um, different planet positions. So once we define that optimization problem, we can move on to the gecko uh, part, which is basically putting that optimization problem into, um, into Python code. And gecko is an optimization package. So what we're basically optimizing here is the distance between the satellite and a sun. So for this presentation, I'll use the example of a satellite and a free uh, I'll, I'll use the example of a free moving satellite around the sun, and then we'll explore the applications in future. So first we'll begin with the orbital mechanics. So in these orbital mechanics, there are four main equations we can use. The first one is F equal to minus G M1 M2 by R square. What this is, the, uh, this is, is the force exerted on the satellite by the sun and the momentum of the, uh, here G is the gravitational constant and M1 is the mass of the satellite, M1, M2 is the mass of the sun, and R, R is the distance between them. Next, we have the momentum, which is equal to the mass into velocity of the, of the satellite. So these velocity, this velocity, force, and momentum are all vectors, so they, they obviously have a direction. So um, another important part, uh, part we can address is, the, is splitting a vector into components, which is basically on a Cartesian plane or X and Y axis, you can um, take a vector or a, a certain line and divide it into X components or y, y components so that we can get a diagonal, which is a vector. And um, an example of this is here, where we have uh, two vectors and we can add them and find the difference between them using delta V, which is basically the triangle you can see on the right. Next, we, uh, we can find the distance between two points using the um, Ry square plus Rx square, which is basically the X uh, x distance and y distance and you find the magnitude or the distance between them now now we can move on to the v python simulation which is basically putting these equations into practice so once we put these equations in the v python simulation in python what what we get is simulation of the central body which is the sun uh, mercury is there and we have venus around it and here we can see earth with the um a red the red sphere around it, that's basically the moon, but we can extend it, it to be a satellite. So as you can see, there are more planets. And um, as we move on, you can see how the whole solar system is defined by these equations and we can see the full orbits. Then we can see it from a bigger view. So these are, these are all the ways we can um, demonstrate the uh, orbital mechanics. Now, um, we can move on to the mathematical optimization problem now that we have defined how our planets will be moving, how the sun will be moving. So the variables and changing quantities we have in this problem would be the force, which I have just defined, the momentum, the thrust. So thrust of the satellite would be constrained. So it will have only a limited amount of fuel. And we, we have distance, position. Distance is the distance between sun and satellite and with the position of the satellite. And we have the position and momentum. Differential equations are basically equations that define the rate of change of those values or how fast they change. So the position and the momentum need to need to keep changing as they keep rotating, as satellite keeps rotating around the sun. Then we, our objective is to find the least distance between satellite and the sun so they can communicate very when they're very close to each other. So I've laid out the mathematical optimization problem here. Here we have a minimum of R of TF. R is basically, as I explained, the distance between satellite and the sun at the final time, which I've defined as TF constrained by thrust. Thrust here is a function of time. So thrust is how much uh, thrust should be used to um, move the satellite. So here we have the differential equations is how fast the position of the satellite is changing in the X and Y components, as I've um, mentioned how to divide components into uh, vectors into components. So, and the momentum is changed by these differential equations, which is the force exerted on the satellite plus the thrust which the satellite provides itself to move. And then we can find the distance between them using this formula I've mentioned. And the force exerted on the satellite, these are the components of the forces. Next, we can put the initial conditions of the satellite here. So Rx and Ry are the um, X and Y coordinates of the satellite. And Px and Py are the um, X and Y components of the momentum. Here, this is the final time, the masses. And here, I've constrained the thrust to 5.5 and 10 to the power 6 newtons, which is basically how much thrust the 
um, the satellite can give itself to move around and optimize its position. Now uh, we can move on to the gecko optimization. So all of the equations I've um, told, told you about, they, they come here. So this is basically a part loading the initial um, conditions of the satellite or the, the whole system. Here we've defined our constants, which I've explained. And here we've discretized time or brought, in, uh, brought time into a variable. So we can use time to calculate different values. And these are the components of X1, Y1, and X2, Y2, which is basically the coordinates of the sun and the satellite. And here we have the force and thrust, uh, as I've shown in the previous slide. And the momentum is here. And then the, the equations come um, in a sequence here. So it's very, all very logical, as I've laid out in the previous slide. And our objective is finally to find minus RF, or it's basically to minimize um, minimize the distance between the satellite and the sun at the final time. So at the end of all this, our model size comes to be 12 variables and four constants and eight equations. So finally, we can move on to the applications and future of this project. Here we, uh, we can use this project to optimize communication times during a planned space mission. An example of this is Voyager 1. As you can see in this animation, uh, Purple, the purple line is Voyager 1 and it just passes these planets. So as it comes closer, we can find the optimum time and location it can communicate with this planet. So um, that, that's one example. Another example is optimizing satellite pass for communication when it's traveling to the sun, as I explained in this whole presentation, as it um, it's during that path to, towards the sun. Um, it can communicate to other satellites in orbit around the sun when they're free of a planet, so interplanetary satellite rendezvous or um, satellites to ground stations on planets. So all of this can be used to maybe cover points of interest on certain planets or other points of uh, interest on other bodies like the sun or even communicate mid space when it's needed. So um, I'd like to thank my mentor, Rebecca, for helping me through this. And um, I've enjoyed Polygens a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for an amazing presentation. Once again, if anybody has any questions, if you could just either put them in the chat or the Q&A. Yeah, if anyone had any questions about the differential equations, because that part might have been a bit confusing. One question was, what challenges did you face while implementing your project? So one of the challenges I faced was actually writing down the optimization problem. Because like that, um, I couldn't figure out which equations to put in exactly. I couldn't figure out how to make time a variable and use that time variable as uh, to calculate different values or um, differential equations. And another one I probably faced was in implementing the Gecko code or the Gecko Python optimization code. So transferring that from the math, mathematical, mathematical problem to uh, Python, it requires some amount of interpretation. And that took a really long time to convert it into the Python language. see one more. Um, another question asks, do you think we should be working on the space junk problem rather than optimizing satellite paths? Yeah, so like at the beginning of my polygens um, journey, I actually thought about um, space debris and space junk problems. But I even found the satellite trajectories um, very fascinating. So actually, this, um, this code could be modified to find the optimal path around um, planets, for example, to avoid satellite um, debris or um, satellite space junk. So that's one of the applications you can use it for. But of course, we'd have to extend it and find 
another way to implement it. But um, to answer your question, should we should we be working on space junk problems? So that, that's obviously a big concern. But um, I think I found uh, optimizing satellite paths more interesting. And space junk problems um, uh, are more bound to Earth and how um, there's more space junk around Earth. And I kind of wanted to um, uh, address future problems of how we communicate much easier and how um, common people or um, common people could access satellite data and satellite um, predictions. Very nice. Good responses. Um, anybody else have any last minute questions? Otherwise, we will move on along to our next presenter. Oh, yes, one more. Um, what is your favorite part of the presentation of your work? Yeah, so I think the favorite part of my work was the vPython present, uh, simulation because it was really fun um, visualizing all the um, satellite parts and, um, you know, kind of putting it into uh, Python because that, that took a lot of time, but at the end it was worth it because I got to see um, what exactly I made. And it was kind of very rewarding because um, that's kind of what, like looking at those images was kind of fascinating. Yeah, amazing. Very nice work again. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so next up we will have I believe this will be the last one for this group. Um, we have Hayden Ma, a senior from Hong Kong. Hi. Hello. Perfect. I can see your screen. So ready when you are. Okay. Uh, good evening or good morning, depending on where you're coming from. I'm very excited to be here today to share with all of you my project on the importance of increasing diversity in clinical trials. First off, a little bit about me. My name is Hayden. I'm currently a senior at Hong Kong International School. I've always been very passionate about medicine, science, and health, and even from a very young age, I've had the dream to pursue a career in these fields one day, more specifically as a physician. To begin, I'd like to dive into a little bit of the background of clinical trials and their lack of diversity. Uh, clinical trials are essential to advancing medical knowledge and patient care by discovering safe and more efficient medical treatments. However, not everyone responds to these drugs and treatments in the same way. A medical study even found that people from different racial groups reacted differently to about 20% of new drugs. This is why diversity in trials is necessary to ensure that results are generalizable and representative of patients who may use the treatment. Yet data has shown us that the majority of trials and studies conducted have been primarily based on people of European descent. This has led to many unfortunate consequences, such as negatively affecting patient safety, especially those from underrepresented groups, and impacting the future of medicine. This issue with the lack of diversity present in clinical trials stems a lot from the knowledge gaps between the scientists and the general population. Scientists often find themselves struggling with presenting scientific information to the general population in a digestible manner. Due to this knowledge gap, typically only highly educated people are in clinical trials. This is why the first goal of my project was to communicate scientific information in a simple manner. 
As a future physician and perhaps future scientist, this project has helped me develop the skill of good scientific communication that many scientists and physicians seem to lack. My other project goals consisted of bringing attention to the lack of diversity within clinical trials and spreading awareness and encouragement to potential participants with the hopes of increasing diverse participation in trials. With these goals in mind, the result of my project was a jargon-free fact sheet targeting potential trial participants with the intent to increase their comfort and knowledge regarding the basics of clinical trials and their lack of diversity. One of the first aspects I included in my fact sheet was a figure highlighting the process in which a clinical trial undergoes. As you can see, clinical trials go through five phases, um, from the preclinical phase that takes place in the lab to phase four, which um, is when the treatment is approved by the FDA and is widely used in the population. The overall process takes years to complete, with some phases taking years themselves to complete. This process is complex, but I found it really important for potential participants to understand. While I was researching and learning about this complex process, I concluded that understanding the complexity of this process and how it takes years is very focused and careful in their testing, added to the credibility, reliability, and trustworthiness of trials. And I wanted to make sure I communicated this clearly with others. To do this, I had to make sure the figure was simple to understand, so instead of using text, I made sure it was visually easy to follow. The second aspect I included in my fact sheet was the patient's role. I wanted to stress the importance of a patient's role and how, as potential participants, they have a real voice, are valued, and will be taken well care of during the process. The goals of this section were to clearly establish the benefits and opportunities of participating in a clinical trial some of which include taking responsibility for your own health care and helping others through your contributions to the advancement of medical knowledge. With the box on the right, I highlighted the fact that as a participant, you will have to sign an informed consent document, which contains all the details of the trial and indicates that you can back out of the trial at any time. I especially wanted to include this to help emphasize that it all really comes down to the individual participant and their personal choice. By including this section of your role, I hope to add a more personal touch to the fact sheet in order to help increase the comfort with this whole process. The next section of my fact sheet was questions and considerations. Clinical trial researchers and scientists are very educated. And as I mentioned in the beginning, they sometimes are unable to relay this scientific information in a simple, understandable manner. So it's really important for participants to take initiative and not be afraid to clarify anything regarding the trial that may have been hard to understand. Next, throughout the research project, I found there were similar themes and concerns for potential participants, including safety, time and resource required, especially with costs, and the usefulness and results of the process. I compiled all this information from different sources and summarized the key points then presented them in a concise manner. Addressing these misconceptions was an important aspect that needed to be included because misconceptions often discourage people from participating. So the goal with this section was really just to clear things up, have a place where all the information is in one place together and to encourage more willing participation. Now, the most important section of my fact sheet was addressing the issue at hand with the lack of diversity present in clinical trials. I mentioned earlier some of the significant impacts caused by the lack of diversity, but highlighting these in this section was a way to gain insight into the bigger picture. I'd like to take a moment now to guide you through this figure. So as you can see, there are two pie charts that compare the representation of groups in the US population and clinical trials. In the US, 72% of the population is represented by Caucasian and others, 16% by Hispanics, and 12% by African Americans. Looking at the distribution of representation with clinical trial participants, 94% of participants are represented by Caucasian or others, 5% by African Americans, and only 1% by Hispanics. Just taking a look at these statistics, you can already easily visualize how significant this problem is. The goal with this section was to educate people about this problem, but I also focused on motivating and inspiring people to do something about this issue. To conclude this presentation, I'd like to share with you one more key point. 
The need for clinical trials to be more diverse is not only crucial for more equitable healthcare, but plays a critical role in the future of healthcare with precision medicine. Precision medicine is an emerging approach to treatment that looks at each person's genetics, lifestyles, and environment to determine the best treatment for that person. Precision medicine mainly utilizes genomic data to tailor treatments based on an individual's characteristics. However, a similar theme is reappearing in which diversity is lacking. With only around 20% of individuals of non-European descent being represented in genome-wide studies, the urgency to break down the barriers preventing diversity seen in clinical trials is even greater. As precision medicine is growing in the US, it is vital to establish diversity immediately so these underrepresented groups present in clinical trials will not be further left behind in medical advances. I would like to give a quick shout out to my mentor, Elizabeth, who has provided me with so much encouragement, guidance, and support throughout this project. I have learned so much, and I'm very proud of the work I've done and of the impact I hope it has made. And I couldn't have done this without her, so thank you, Elizabeth. Also, a special thank you to Polygens for this opportunity, my family and friends, especially my parents for supporting me throughout, and to all of you attending my presentation, I am very appreciative of your time. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope you gained some valuable takeaways. And if you have any further questions, feel free to email me. And also you can find my fact sheet on Twitter, which is posted on the slide. Additionally, you may watch out for the op-ed I am in the process of submitting for publication. Thank you. Amazing job, great presentation. Again, if people have questions, go ahead, put them in the chat or the Q&A. I guess I'll start us off with one. I'm also hopefully going to be pursuing a career in medicine. And I know a lot of the issues around increasing diversity in the field is increasing accessibility and awareness. And um, another issue is some people in, in various cultures, you know, there's been a bad relationship that's been established with medicine and they don't completely trust um, the field. And so they might not want to participate in clinical trials or even maybe read such a wonderful fact sheet that you came mm -hmm. up with. Um, I'm kind of curious, what is one way in which you might address this issue? Um, it's a big one. Yeah. Um, I mean, taking a look at the issue of the lack of diversity in clinical trials just itself and kind of looking at different ways of how um, a difference can be seen, that was kind of one of the things I started with this project is looking at how I can actually make an impact. And so what my project did was I focused a lot on the awareness, but also if I could do something bigger and help increase diversity for clinical trials, it also stems a lot from starting with increasing the diversity within um, physicians and scientists and the medical field itself, just like you mentioned, because there is like a lot of distrust and um, past histor historical mistreatments in the medical field that has led to these underrepresented groups not feeling safe or wanting to um, participate in these trials, which has definitely uh, resulted in this lack of diversity. And so um, just increasing uh, this is about diversity within the physicians and scientists is also really good because if we had more people from these backgrounds, perhaps we could get more creative and better solutions and people who actually understand where these people um, in these underrepresented groups are coming from. And I think that could just really improve overall the medical field itself and the diversity in these trials. Yes, great answer. I completely agree. <laughs> Um, another question here was, what steps do you think should be taken and prioritized outside of the medicine spectrum to ensure more diversity in clinical trials? Outside of the medicine spectrum. 
Um, I mean, uh, kind of steps outside the medicine spectrum, I think could involve just the general population. So involving you guys who are now aware of this issue and kind of um, bridging together and creating this communication with each other and sharing this information and just making that it's um, bringing awareness to it and just encouraging uh, people that you may know who are going to potentially be in a trial. Um, just encouraging them to ask questions, to not be afraid of the process, to just support them. And I think that would be a step outside of the medicine spectrum. Yes. And one last question we'll take here is, apart from awareness of this diversity issue and helpful information from your work, do you think training medical professionals about cross-cultural friendliness is also important? Definitely, yes. Um, just knowing, just having the understanding of where these different groups are standing and kind of where they come from is definitely important because not only is awareness really important for increasing the diversity, but also the communication with these potential participants, communication with the whole team that works with clinical trials, such as um, the clinical trial investigators, the physicians, and, um, we see that there's a little bit of a lack of communication with like clinical trial investigators with um, say the physicians and physicians are usually the most trusted uh, people that participants go to for this information. So when physicians don't really understand the process themselves or where these people are coming from, then of course we're going to get a lack of um, knowledge gaps or a lack of trust and so definitely training medical professionals in this um, area would be beneficial. Amazing, thank you so much for such a well thought out presentation and for your responses to these questions. Thank you. I think we're possibly going to try and squeeze in one more student. Um, I know they were kind of having some trouble connecting, though, so I'm not quite sure, just because I know our session is up rather soon. Um, so if you guys don't mind bearing with me for a little bit. Okay, perfect. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. 
Thanks so much for being able to join us. Um, everyone, I know this session is supposed to, I think supposedly end at 11.10. I don't think it will necessarily kick us out, but if you need to go, feel free. Otherwise, feel free to stay on for this last presentation. Um, and yeah, let me know if you're yeah, able I'll to share screen, all right. Um, yeah, I'm trying to do that right now. Okay. Um, can everybody see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Eja Turhal and I'm from Istanbul, Turkey. I'm uh, currently a year two IB student at an American college. And my main interests are chemistry, engineering, and env environmental studies. I also love playing volleyball and discovering new music. So, um, just briefly, let me just uh, talk about the timeline of my presentation. Um, first, I'm going to talk about what led me to research this topic and explain some key terms, then moving on to my uh, discussing my thesis and analyzing my data. And after that, um, we can I can answer some questions if you have some. So what are my motivations? Um, Currently, palm oil has an extreme harmful impact on the planet. So as you, uh, some of might have heard before, palm oil production has um, been a recent uh, controversy in, um, in globally, because when the trees grow too high, it is harder to collect food. So um, therefore, the rainforests are being cut down, and this is contributing to a global deforestation. Um, not only that, it has also led to greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, um, contributing to, to climate change, which is also a global issue right now. And um, it also uh, has threatened 54% um, uh, of mammals and 64% of uh, birds globally. Um, so this is generally a, a map of as to what ex extent palm oil uh, has been produced. So you guys might ask, why, so that why don't we switch to an alternative vegetable oil, right? But uh, the main thing is uh, to get the same amount of alternative oil, like soybean, coconut, sunflower oil, uh, which, can, which you can see from the uh, picture right here, uh, it would, be, need uh, between four to ten times more land. Um, so as a result, to um, to use other alternative oils would not be uh, an end to this um, issue if we simply shift the problem to other parts. So in brief, um, what is my research paper is focused on um, to understand the concepts, um, first of all, let me talk about uh, what are palm oil, what is it, what is, uh, it is used in. So the, the oil that is collected from the fruit, uh, the palm fruit of the uh, uh, palm vegetable um, is edible, is an edible vegetable oil. And you can find it in 62% of the packaged product that you might find in a supermarket. And it is beneficial because it does not raise cholesterol. However, uh, the, the palm kernel oil that is extracted from the palm seed is used in cosmetic products and it has many functional benefits. So this, in this research paper, I will be uh, focusing on the palm, uh, palm kernel oil that is used in cosmetic products um, because it is uh, a significant, it has a significant role in cosmetic and personal care products. So one of the derivatives uh, that is commonly used in the, in the cosmetic industry is called um, palm kernel oil diethylamide, uh, for short palm DEA. It acts as a emulsifier and that means it raises uh, the viscosity and stabilizes it. Um, so the product you have is not very uh, viscous and it's not too uh, liquid. 
Uh, it also acts as a foam booster, uh, which helps penetration of dirt. And finally, it stabilizes all of the uh, other ingredients used in a, um, in a product, as well as adjusting its pH. So, um, in more detail, the DEA uh, is formed from a fatty acid, and you can see the, um, the formulation of uh, the ethanol amide. So we have the, uh, the carbon fatty acid chains and an amine that is, uh, that is a chemical. And as a result, we have fatty acid amide and gl uh, glycerol. And this uh, chemical additive is used in shampoos, detergents, and cleaning products. Um, so as an sustainable uh, alt um, alternative, I focused uh, on algae oil. So the micro -al uh, algae is produced from uh, sunlight, um, grows 10 times more rapidly than terrestrial plants, which is, which is great because then uh, this fast uh, cultivation of algae plants um, can lead to an equivalent amount of oil um, with less land. Um, and therefore, algae oil does not introduce new um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and does not require uh, fresh water. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to found algae oil to conduct uh, during my experiment. So instead, uh, I used omega-3 oil um, to synthesize a fatty acid DEA. Um, the reason why I used omega-3 oil is because it has also um, the uh, high levels of DHA and PA, um, EPA. Uh, and these are fatty acids um, in omega-3 oil. So um, overall, I synthesize an omega-3 oil-based DEA and I analyze its components to make sure if it had a, ne a necessary amount of amide content inside it. Um, then I use that uh, new DEA to, um, to produce a hand soap. So I could, uh, you know, compare it to a normal hand soap and analyze its variables. Simply, the procedure was to use uh, a necessary amount of omega-3 oil and diethanol amine. We need amine to conduct uh, the procedure. And I also added some sodium ethylene powder to speed up the process. And all of this procedure is, um, is applied four hours uh, with a diffusion pump. So the reaction would not... Uh, uh, would Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So um, as for uh, the results, um, there was a simply um, miss, um, let me just show you with the um, video. So as you can see in the video, on the left hand side, it's the soap that I um, produced with my DEA. And on the left side, we can see a hand soap that is more viscous and and is clearer. So the reason why this happened, um, so the omega-3 oil that I used has a cyclic structure. That means it has, uh, uh, it has bond, carbon bonds that is harder to break. So uh, in a normal uh, hand soap procedure, you would use up to uh, 100 temperatures 100 Celsius temperatures, but to break, to be able to break the cyclic structure of an omega-3 oil, we would probably need a thousand degrees um, to to contact, to um, to produce amide content. So, for my, uh, for further uh, further in this investigation, I would suggest to use higher temperature uh, during uh, the synthesis of the uh, omega-3 DEA, and then um, again analyze its end results because in the video you can see that the the 
the hand soap that I uh, produced is not clear enough. And the reason is because the bonds wasn't able to break, there were still um, omega-3 oils inside uh, my DEA. So when I applied it to a hand soap, the, uh, it wasn't clear and it wasn't viscous enough. Um, so generally, that was my research paper. Um, I can now get some questions, and I would also like to thank everybody who has helped me with this experience. Thanks so much. Very nice job. <laughs> Again, for Q&A, just go ahead and type them out, and I shall read them off. I actually have kind of a general application type question. Um, I find that from what I've read and whatnot, a lot of issues with kind of changing to these more eco-friendly, climate-friendly um, products is kind of incentivizing these companies to actually implement them because I think sometimes the cost is maybe more than you know the revenue they might get on it. So. I'm kind of curious if you have thought of any steps or ideas in which you might be able to incentivize companies to switch to these maybe better products or better ways of making these products. Yeah, that is actually a very good point because um, many uh, manufacturers um, want to um, produce their cosmetic products in a more um, cost-effective cost way. So to be able to do that, they wouldn't want extreme he heat um, to produce their products or or maybe uh, deal it with the little amount that they, that they use, they would um, get the, they would yield an um, equivalent amount of, um, for example, the EA. So yeah, so the main issue, if I would, I were to, make this make this um algemite dea um the uh, the other companies wouldn't want it uh, because it, it it requires extreme heat that's all thank you i'm just waiting to see if anybody else puts any other questions? That was pretty cool though. So you were actually able to carry it out in lab. Is that part of your research that you're doing with your college and whatnot? Um, actually, I was really lucky to uh, conduct my experiments in, um, in one of my family companies because they also produced, uh, they're so interested in chemistry and other uh, cosmetic products. So even though it's not their main um, area, I was able to use their uh, materials. Very nice. It was really unlucky that I wasn't able to, you know, make the reaction in an, in a an high temperature environment. So the the end result of my hand soap wasn't really good, and it was it would probably uh, wouldn't give enough customer satisfaction because <laughs> it's it's all it's like literally like water. <laughs> but it does it does foam and it still it, it's still cleaning well. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. All righty. I just wanted to give a few closing remarks um, and say thank you so much to all the presenters today for your hard work on your projects and a huge thank you to all the audience members for coming to support these students during their presentations. We really appreciate it. Um, we at Polygens are incredibly proud of all your achievements and I'm very thoroughly impressed with what you guys have been able to accomplish and we're so glad we got to cheer you on and celebrate you at this stage. And we would like to encourage you to attend and support other student presentations throughout the rest of the day. You can just kind of go right back to the reception area. The There's a button on the left that says reception and click on other sessions and enjoy other presentations. Um, but for now, that concludes this session. I 
think that there might be a talk from a keynote speaker right now that's going live. So if you want to hop over to the live icon and stages, there might be um, a talk from a Stanford data science professor and co-organizer of the Global Women in Data Science Conference. So please join them on that stage if you would like to do so. Thank you so much, everybody.